those of you who don't have the, set, the class readings and the schedule of the lectures and so on, we will hand some of those out after the class. We have run out of those. But I hope the majority of you have that. Uh, schedule of the, of the lectures and um, it gives the assignments and so forth. And I might talk about that for a moment and say some things about it. And then if you all have any questions, well, you can ask me. Can you hear me? No. I have to talk to this thing. Can you hear me now? Uh, does anybody, is there anybody who can't hear me now? Yeah. Well, how do you turn this on? <laughs> Can you hear me now? <laughs> well, the light is on. <laughs> uh, the mic. Come on, don't we have an engineer? <laughs> assignments and all, I hope that is self-explanatory. That is, uh, the topics in A are spliced in with the historical topics. So there'll be two classes under A, A1 uh, today and Monday, and then after we're through with that, why we'll move on to Locke and Hume. And then we'll go down ABC, and each ladder is a separate class, so it means there'll be three classes under Locke and Hume. Then we go back to A2, okay, and then it proceeds on from there. I think there are, en are enough instructions as to how it's supposed to go. And it adds up to 24 classes, and perhaps there are only 22 or 21. I didn't count them, but we'll do the best we can to get through this material as planned. Are there any questions about that? Now, in past years, there's been some of complaint about the assignments being a bit vague, and I have tried to correct that by saying that for each class there's a particular reading that you should do. So if you're conscientious and you keep up with the reading while well, you know where we are, and I will try to follow this. And I think if you do the readings, you'll be able to uh, get more out of what I've said in here uh, and in the section. So I hope you'll be able to do that. Is anybody hearing me at all back there? Oh, yes. Uh, so I hope those are 
self-explanatory and we'll be able to follow it. At any rate, I will explain it as we go along how it's supposed to go. Now, on page two, there's a remark in there about I know that a lot of these meetings are extremely difficult. And in fact, I don't believe any of them are easy, but some are more difficult than others. <coughs> and in fact, if you haven't read any of Kant before, you probably make very little sense out of the groundwork. Very little sense. However, it's a book you should try, and I'll do the best I can to convey the way I read it. No two people probably who had thought about it a lot read it the same way. It's a very hard book and that there are a lot of books of which that is the case. These are hard things and um, people interpret them in different ways. And it isn't that any way you interpret them is equally good. Some interpretations are lousy, but there are a number of them that are really quite good and it's hard to pick the same. I hope at any rate we offer one that is respectable. Um, even if it's not generally accepted insofar as we have time to talk about Kant and about any of the other writers. So don't be dismayed if you disagree, if you disagree with each other and those are in sections, or don't be surprised if the teaching fellows don't say the same thing I do. That's entirely proper and I hope that happens. Or if you have some alternatives. Now, I forgot to add under the text um, TJ there, but I believe they have it in the store. I'm going over after with the scoop. I don't believe everything's in. If they're all out, I'll order some more text. Now, there on F, are there any questions about anything, say, uh, connected with F there? That's about the exam and about. The weekly section will, will begin the week after next. I don't think we can organize them before that time. But beginning the week after next, why, we shall have sections. I ought to say about the examination that I will hand out, we will hand out in advance um, a list of questions that will organize your reading preparations for the examination. So it's not a surprise examination. Uh, these may be difficult questions, but at any rate you know what you'll be asked and you can prepare for it. The idea of that exam is to organize your study for the course. So you don't frantically try to learn everything. That's simply impossible. You can't do that. So we will have them out ahead of time. And if any of you have not met the formal requirement to take the class, if you come up afterwards, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to sign a card and to waive that. <laughs> um, the idea being I will give a kind of warning of some sort that you, you know, I mean, you can do it if you try, but you should, it's a, it's, it's a way of saying that some previous philosophy does help. It isn't a matter of knowledge or technical knowledge particularly, but it's knowledge of having some awareness of what the subject is <coughs> like. Now, this year is something of an experiment, and I may find out that it's not a good idea, that that is spending so, so much time on a book that I wrote myself. I know when I was an undergraduate, I just I was very unhappy about professors who talked about their own book, and I think probably at that time I was right rather than now. But in any case, <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to do it at some risk. I've not done this before, and maybe I will never do it again. We'll see. Uh, so while 171 will be given next year, or in all likelihood it will be given, I doubt very much I'll do it in the same way. A third thing I thought I would mention is that in these texts, they're rather extremely difficult. I said, particularly a few of them, 
you're only responsible for the things that we talk about and the problems that we actually take up in here and take up in sections. So you're not required to know everything that you might know about, about Marx, for example, or about Kant, even about the groundwork. You'd be responsible for things that we talk about them and at the level that we're able to talk about. So in that sense, you know the kinds of things that you ought to be aware of. Another thing I thought of might, another observation I thought I would make about the class is that on the whole, that it tends to be cumulative in the sense that if you don't know uh, what has gone on, say, the first month, you tend to get lost after a while and you don't see the point of the things that are said later. Now, how far that's actually the case, I don't know. I've been told that's the case, so I pass it on to you. It's a good idea to keep up if you can, if that is so. Well, those are all the introductory comments I thought I would make about this. Does anyone have anything they'd like to ask at this point? Well, are you sure? Is anything? I know this is a large room, but there might be. Yes. Office hours. Ah, well, I'll have office hours. Yes, after the class on Monday, um, give some time for it to be over, but say beginning about three thirty. Uh, okay. Now, uh, beginning of class, I handed out three sheets which is kind of a summary of what I had hoped to get over today. And I don't do this every day, because this is just kind of add to your burden. Uh, but I thought I would do it at the beginning, so we would be able to have uh, some more record of fundamental ideas that I had gone over to start with. Um, yes? What? Sorry? Yes, I know you don't. Uh, we'll have some more done up, so they'll be handed out on Monday. How many of you do not have a copy of the three pages that I handed out? So that's a, and how many of you do? So that's about another, okay. So that's about half of you have a copy and half don't. So that's an estimate of. If, if they want to wait, we could do them after class, if anyone sort of has time. Otherwise, Monday, we'll help you. Yeah. Well, if you want them right away, um, we'll try to do some after class. Otherwise, they'll be available Monday, okay? And I will go over them so you'll be able to know what uh, is being said. Now, I, I begin on the list, or on the sheet, um, with a few introductory comments. The first one is, that since in this class we're going to approach political philosophy in a particular way, I want to emphasize that there are many ways in which political philosophy can be conceived. And different writers will, at different times, think of their work and its nature and aims in a different way. And this will be true of all the writers who we read. But all of them are, I might say, belong to what I here call the modern democratic tradition of thought. And all of them, except for Marx, we count as liberal. So what we are discussing is a particular group of writers, all of whom are in the runway Democrats and all of them but one, or we could count as liberal. Now, in this class, I regard liberalism from within the tradition of political philosophy. So it isn't a view about particular social policy, although at some particular time it, it may be identified with such, but it's a kind of philosophical view about the nature and grounds of the institutions that we uh, today associate and have been as 
associated with constitutional democracy. It's how do you explain, justify, and so on, from a philosophical point of view, these institutions? Uh, and that's the meaning of it that I have in mind. And it has some characteristic elements of the liberal view. And as we go through, I will try to identify those and how they are regarded and understood by different writers. Now, like much else, going on now to second comment, political philosophy rises often from different felt needs. These needs are not the same, but a particular one that I mentioned <coughs> here is that in any society, uh, there are certain sharp and divisive and apparently irresolvable political questions. And sometimes over long periods of time, did they seem irresolvable. And I mentioned an example of that is in the case of the wars of religion in the 16th and 17th century. And then as a result of that, or in part as a result of that, and beginning with, say, about the 18th century, people accepted some form of the principle of toleration. Uh, one might say that that principle is a way of coping with the problem of religious pluralism. Uh, it's a, as a result of that. So we might say that in those the two centuries, there are many de philosophical tracks and discussions about that principle and how far it's uh, compatible with Christianity, how far it depends on skepticism, how far it depends on indifference to religion and all those matters was, was hotly discussed. It's not now discussed because it's not a problem, but that's the historical origin of the principle. And I think also that one of the important historical origins of liberalism is in that controversy. It's not the only one, but it's a basic principle, I think, of liberalism is some kind of principle of toleration. And different philosophical views will give a different account of it and the source of it. Now, passing on to number Three is then simply to comment on that and say that the purpose or aim or one purpose or aim of political philosophy is to discuss these kind of sharply divisive issues in a certain period of time. And the one that in this class plan to discuss or to focus on, or we can say things as uh, beginning from, is the conflict over the understanding about what conflicting claims between liberty and equality. That's a phrase that I use. And I'm thinking of over the course of democratic thought over the past roughly, let's say, two centuries or, or so, makes plain to us, I think, that there's no public agreement on how basic institutions of democracy or of our society are to be arranged if they are to be, and here I use a somewhat vague <coughs> phrase, appropriate to the liberties and nature of citizenship uh, regarding citizens as free and equal persons. In other words, there is a division between <coughs> Uh, the division within the democratic uh, tradition of thought, uh, between the uh, tradition that derives uh, from Locke, let's say, uh, and the uh, tradition that derives from Rousseau. And I use here a way to express that, saying that the tradition of deriving uh, from Locke emphasizes what Constant called the Libraries of the, of the moderns, that is, freedom of speech and of thought, liberty of conscience and various um, rights of equal citizenship, 
uh, civil in nature, and on the other hand, the uh, tradition that derives from Rousseau, which Constance said emphasizes the memories of the ancients. Constance was a French writer who lived from about 1770 to about 1830. I don't, uh, I've forgotten the exact dates. Now, the memories of the ancients were roughly the memories of citizens, namely adult male citizens, of the Athenian democracy. And so, by saying that the tra tradition derived <coughs> from Rousseau emphasizes those, uh, Constant meant that it emphasizes uh, the values of public life and public participation in politics and so on, as opposed to the other uh, tradition. Now that's a very sharp conflict within this uh, tradition and it, 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 while both sides of it will recognize all of these values on, on each side, not to say, they're going to weight them in very different ways. And there's an explanation for this, namely in how certain things are conceived and how certain philosophical notions are interpreted. So although, now going on to number five, although it's the case that this conflict is supported by um, conflicts of interest of different kinds, material interests, religious interests, and so forth, organizational interests, and it's also um, supported by, or made more worse by, differences of opinion about the consequences of certain social policies. So we might say that's a, an empirical matter as to what are the effects of certain institutions. But also at the same time, I think there's a conflict of view as to how these uh, notions are to be conceived, whereby conflict of view, I mean some philosophical or moral or political view, and it's those that in this class we are particularly interested in. So th there are, as I mentioned here, two particular views that we're concerned with. On the one hand, we're concerned with the uh, doctrine of the social contract, which we can take to be represented by Hobbes and Locke, of Rousseau and Kant, and there's the utilitarian tradition, which we can take to be represented by Hume and Bentham and J.S. Mill and Sedgwick. Uh, and that's a very impressive philosophical tradition, and as I mentioned, includes almost, also includes almost all of the great English economists over, say, a period of 150 years to 1750 to about 1900. So it's not only a moral and political view, it's also these people were also at the same time very important economic, political, and social uh, theorists. And that way, it's very rare to find that happen over such a long period of time at such a high level. Well, it's no surprise there were that many smart people in it, it's been a very strong view. It's had enormous influence. One might say it's, uh, even at today, it's the dominant view in some form or other. Lots of people uh, in different subjects. So, to come to the final introductory remark, I mentioned about, I make a reference to the preface of T.J., paragraphs of two and five, where uh, the aims of the, of the text are stated, uh, first aim being uh, to work out a reasonably systematic conception of political justice that provides an alternative to the dominant <coughs> utilitarianism of our, and I put in brackets, English-speaking philosophical tradition. I, I put in those brackets because if you go to the continent, uh, you wouldn't at all find the same thing. And second, to show that 
this conception of political justice provides a more appropriate basis for democratic institutions and a more accurate characterization of our considerative <laughs> convictions about political justice than, say, the utilitarian view. So it should do two things if it succeeds. It will first offer a reasonably systematic alternative political conception. Say reasonably systematic uh, because the utilitarian view is also reasonably systematic. So you want to try to offer something that has some of the same virtues. But of course, system itself is not the prime value um, or the prime criterion. You want a view that is a more adequate, more appropriate basis of democratic institutions. So that's the second of these is perhaps actually the more important of the two. But in commenting on the preface, it does say uh, both things. Now, the view that is proposed adapts various ideas from the social contract tradition. It also adapts various ideas from Lacan. And as I emphasize there, I say it adapts them and not adopts them because they're not the same idea. These ideas undergo a shift when you put them in another framework. So I urge you to keep in mind that the idea of the social contract, for example, is not going to be the same in Hobbes as it is in, in Locke. It won't be the same in Rousseau or Kant or any other writer probably that you pick. There are going to be variations on these. That is, in the case of uh, four people like that, Kant and Locke uh, and Rousseau and Hobbes, they're going to be different. Uh, you want to be aware of the differences and how they change and why. Uh, and it's not, not knowing how they change and why that uh, is always the, the most interesting thing. So I just want to emphasize that while there are contract ideas in TJ, uh, Kantian ideas, they're not the same. And I will try to uh, make clear what the differences are, but it's interesting uh, to make comparisons between any two writers in this sense and to see why those differences occur. So it's the nature of the, you might say, of the whole view and why it's set up the way it is. It's going to determine how any particular idea in the end is interpreted and gets used. And you want to be sensitive to that. Well, th those are some introductory comments on the kind of thing that doing why. Um, am I making any sense? Um, I know this is a large room, but uh, if I get particularly something seems extremely dense. I don't mind if somebody were, were to say so or to raise a question. This, uh, this can be hard to listen to. Well, I'm now on page two for those who have it. The, the, the heading of that is fundamental ideas. And I might say to those of you who d d don't have the sheets, I am going over it so you're not really missing anything. Although I'm not going over it precisely the same way. <coughs> now, since the aim of TJ is to provide a moral basis for democratic institutions, or let's say an appropriate moral basis for democratic institutions and to address this long-standing conflict as to how the claims of liberty and equality are to be understood, how are we to deal with that? Well, in this particular case, and in, in setting up TJ, I think of it as looking to the public political culture of a democratic society 
for certain basic intuitive ideas and principles that can be worked up into a conception of political justice. In, in other words, uh, we're going to try to look somehow on ideas of, with which we're all familiar as members of this kind of society and knowing something about its history, knowing something about its constitution, knowing something about important documents like the Declaration of Independence and so forth, you've heard those things, and the general nature of the political culture, you should be somewhat familiar. This isn't a matter of being extremely educated, it's a matter of paying some attention to the political culture uh, say, reading papers about Supreme Court cases and so on, you have some idea what the Supreme Court does. I'm not talking about anything but family deep in the sense of godly knowledge, but some awareness of the political culture. One looks to that for certain basic intuitive ideas and then tries to work them up into some kind of political conception of justice. So the idea is you should have a lot of familiarity with these from everyday discussion of political matters. Now, I emphasize that, well, I will come to this, perhaps I, uh, but you'll notice I keep using the phrase political justice and not just justice. Now, I don't, that that is not done in TJ and that has encouraged a lot of misunderstanding, but I'm doing it now. This is a conception of political justice, um, but I will come to that. Now, some of these basic intuitive ideas are more basic than others, you might say. So some of them are used in, say, some view, and this will be true of justice and fairness, it will be used to give structure to the whole view and to organize the whole view in some kind of systematic doctrine. And these ideas, perhaps a few of them I will call fundamental intuitive ideas. And I'll go over three today if I have time and go over three more on Monday. And that will serve as a kind of in introduction to what will be going on. Now, the basic, or the, maybe I'd say the most fundamental, if you use that phrase in justice as fairness, is the idea of society itself as a system of social cooperation between citizens regarded as free and equal persons. That's the basic intuitive idea that society itself is a system of cooperation uh, between citizens as free and equal persons. Now I'm not saying you accept that idea, I'm not saying that you believe it's true of the society in which you live, but that you can understand that after some reflection and developing it into a notion of some sort. It's accessible to you. Now, perhaps it isn't, but anyway, I believe it is. Uh, and we're going to try to work on that idea and others other than that are analogous. Now, in saying that society is a system of cooperation between citizens, uh, we suppose that from a political point of view and in the context of public discussion of political questions, citizens uh, do not regard their social order as a fixed natural order. They can change it. They can change institutions. They're not fixed natural order that can be changed. Or they do not regard the social order as an institutional hierarchy publicly justified by political or aristocratic values. It may be that lots of people believe that, that they are also justified by religious values. 
may be that some people believe they're also justified by uh, the values of other kinds. But from the context of public discussion, we're going to adopt the idea when we work with this model that it's not justified in those ways, but in terms of values that, be con that can be connected with the, the way in which we develop uh, this idea of society as a system of cooperation between citizens as free and equal persons. It will have to be values in some sense that come from that that are basic ones in political discussion as opposed to other areas of life. Now, there are three elements in the idea of cooperation that I would like to mention. The first element, features I call them here, is that social cooperation is distinct from merely socially coordinated activity. An example of social, socially coordinated activity would be a lot of people doing things but it turns out that, and they're doing them in a coherent way, they know what the others are doing and so forth, but they're all following orders from some absolute central authority that they never question. Now that's very well coordinated activity, but it's not cooperation, <coughs> I'm going to use the term. Now, of course, here you uh, our ordinary sense of a cooperation is not so precise that it obviously perhaps excludes that case. So what I'm doing is actually defining it, if you like, in a certain kind of way. I'm just going to say that that uh, is not going to be what I mean by cooperation. If the order's from the center and the center can't be questioned, then it's not cooperation. <laughs> so that would be one feature of it. Another feature of a cooperation that it is that it involves some notion of fair terms of cooperation. If people are cooperating, then they have an idea of what the terms of cooperation are and that these terms are fair or ought to be fair if, the co if it's truly cooperation in some, in some sense. If we were forced into it, uh, the terms aren't such that we could accept, but therefore we had no choice, we had to do it, then that puts in doubt that it's cooperation. So cooperation involves that there are fair terms of cooperation, and that these fair terms are publicly recognized, and they involve, that is, fair terms of cooperation involve some principle uh, that characterizes the fair terms of reciprocity or mutuality. There must be some kind of, of fairness between the parties uh, and that kind of a notion has to be involved. And the third notion is it involves the, the idea of each participant's rational advantage for each participant's good. So that the idea of rational advantage specifies what it is that those engaged in cooperation are seeking to advance each from their own point of view. So it's at any rate going to involve, uh, that is, the notion of cooperation. It's going to have those three uh, features. Now, I'll mention in advance to give you some idea that the thing is how are the fair terms of cooperation to pacify? Now, there are different ways of doing that, but in justice and fairness, they get specified by those engaged in cooperation. And of course, it's at that point that some uh, variation of the notion of contract enters in. In other words, that by some agreement of some sort that is an agreement on certain pr 
principles that determine what the fair terms are going to be. So further development of the notion of cooperation is that we're going to say that those engaged in cooperation are the ones that are to determine the fair <coughs> terms of it. But that's we'll be getting ahead of it. Now I turn next to them down to four on the sheet for those of you who have it. Talking about the role of the principles of justice as part of a conception of justice. Their role is to specify what the fair terms of cooperation are. That it's the role of the principles of political justice to define what fair terms of social cooperation are when we think of society as a whole. And the test is discussed, although not exactly in the same way as I have discussed it here in section one, uh, which is part of the assignment for today. Um, sections one, one and two for the day, and three and four uh, for Monday. Okay, so that's their role is to define the fair terms of the cooperation. Now, these principles, if we look at the content of them now, actually what they do is specify basic rights and duties to be assigned by the main political and social institutions, and they regulate the division of benefits that arise through or as a result of social cooperation. Now, since in a democratic society, citizens are thought of as free and equal persons, that is, within this model of, of that kind of society, a conception of justice that may be viewed, as I said, as specifying the fair terms of political cooperation between citizens as and equal person. Okay, I, I hope that's uh, s some idea of what's this first fundamental idea um, from which by adding on other things and the, the helping notions that are within it or requirements that are within it, we're going to attempt to develop, not deduce, of course, but to use as a framework for marking out some kind of view. Now I'm going on to another fundamental idea. Uh, this is introduced on page five of section one. And I'm going to date it here in more or less the same form that it occurred there. That that's the notion of, or the idea, I should say, of a well-ordered society. Now, let's say that a society is well-ordered if it is not only designed to advance the good of its members, but also when it is effectively regulated by a publicly recognized conception of political justice. Now, by definition, this is going to mean the following. Um, first, it will mean that it is a society in which everyone accepts and knows that everyone else accepts the same principles of justice. Now, of course, there has never been a society like that. At least I can't think of one that fulfills all these other conditions. But that for the time being, try not to worry about that. We'll see maybe that this has some, some reason for doing this in this way. Um, but it would mean first that every citizen say, if we think this is the language that we've been using, they all accept the same principles of political justice. Emphasize political justice, because elsewhere they may hold other moral views, but they agree on holding the same principles of <coughs> political justice. And the other, or second characteristic of a railroad society, as defined here, is its main political and social institutions 
are publicly known or with good reason believed to satisfy these principles. So it will be a society in which everyone holds the same principles of justice and also a society in which those institutions that exist satisfy those principles. So it's a society which is institutions of which are, are just. Now, this has the consequence that in a well-ordered society, there is a, we might say, that the publicly recognized political conception of justice establishes a shared point of view from which the citizens' claims on their political and social institutions can be adjudicated. In other words, they're going to make a variety of claims on these institutions, and they're going to argue about whether or not they're just and unjust, and so forth and so on. This argument, in their case, will not be fruitless, or not in any way in principle fruitless, because they agree on what the principles of political justice are. So if they also agree on certain general beliefs and consequences and so on, these questions will be often, although not always, a resolvable. There will be a publicly accepted answer that's possible. I say not always resolvable because uh, no principles can possibly resolve every question. But they can specify a kind of framework within which people can at least talk. And the 16th and 17th centuries, in matters of religious toleration, that is simply not true. There is no common basis from which people can even begin to talk. But if you have um, publicly recognized principles in this sense, then although they don't provide some kind of a, you might say, a deductive apparatus from which you can grind out answers. They may provide enough of the time some kind of framework within which these questions can be discussed. So that's beginning characterization of a well-ordered society. Now the point is, although there may not be may not ever indeed have been, and maybe there cannot even be in any precise way, even, even in heaven, I suppose, or ideal conditions of society this kind. Nevertheless, there may be some conceptions of justice that it's not even possible for them to serve in this role. So, one way to think about a uh, conception of justice is, or certain principles is, is it possible that these principles could ever serve in a society of this sort? And I think we'd like to believe that any conception that we accept would at any rate allow for this possibility. So in this respect, I think the notion of a well-ordered society is a kind of a criterion that we can use to compare conceptions of justice and their various principles in the sense that, well, at least under ideal conditions, there isn't anything about the content of these principles that makes it impossible for a society of this kind to exist. Now the third fundamental intuitive idea. I won't be able to get through this today. We'll have to begin on it on, on Monday. Is the one that's introduced in section two of TJ. So if you can, you should look at that. Uh, namely the notion of the basic structure of society. And that's an attempt to make, and I won't say anything about it now. Actually, it's three o'clock. So I will stop. But it's the the primary subject of justice and uh, it's the thing that in the sense in which I talk about political justice, it's about 
suggest that structure. Can you hear me this way? Anybody who, who can't hear me? Okay, I might prefer that to doing the other. Okay.